Myron here, and it's been quite some time uh, since we uh, did a video uh, back in August 15th, uh, 2014 was the last time, and this is now May uh, 12th, and I want to continue on this exploration uh, abstract uh, art and consciousness uh, together. They're um, interdependent and part of each other and, and really not separate uh, from each other. Some of the painting that has gone on in the past, uh, more classical painting, the early part up to um, mid uh, 19th century was mostly uh, representational painting, accurate anatomical painting, uh, accurate architectural painting, uh, using uh, geometry, geometries uh, to represent uh, the pictorial uh, plane uh, and the invention of the camera. And it was good that artists had that we were able to record historical events, architectural events, uh, merchant events, and uh, world affairs, world leaders, and they were able to document very accurately these events that happened up until the middle of the 19th uh, century. The invention of the camera, of course, allowed a great movement uh, for artists away from uh, representing the pictorial anatomy in the way that the camera now uh, took over recording events and place and people and situation and circumstance. With the advent of Impressionist uh, painting, of course, the image which we knew, uh, which was fairly representational uh, image, uh, began to dissolve and, of course, Impressionism led to post-impressionism to expressionism and the image continued to the pictorial anatomy began to evolve to the early part of the 20th century where we have cubism uh, by uh, Picasso uh, and Braque uh, talking about um, the reformation of the picture plane anatomy into a line, a plane, and form, and also a suggestion, uh, perhaps in linear elements, of a semblance of a vase or a small part of a vase or a table, with a small part of it being indicated to indicate the three-dimensionality of some of these objects that uh, were being painted. Uh, so that really led us from a huge step, Picasso and Braque, from the 19th and the 20th century to begin to allow us to see uh, the world in a much different way. Uh, so the expression uh, of inner values and inner dialogue and inner conversations to really begin to see the modern uh, times, epitomized, of course, um, the 19th century, early uh, 19th century painting, Edvard Munch of the Cry or the Scream, his salvo opening up over uh, humanity of cry, uh, of belief and faith, and the angst that he heralded of the 20th century angst, which is uncertainty, uh, uh, amongst uh, things that were going on uh, in the 20th century, of course, bloodiest and so on, First and Second World War, um, Vietnam War, of course, Desert Storm. Uh, so these things uh, really were heralded by Edvard Munch and the scream and the cry. Sometimes uh, this reality impinges itself upon us. We look in the mirror and what do we see? We see a reflection of our 
perhaps our face, if I say this, and that is the real reality, can we reach out into that mirror and take that image out? No, we can't. And so it merely is an illusionistic space, not unlike the 19th century painters and previous centuries painters were painting an illusionistic space through color and form, uh, perspective, um, some textures, but and the accurate uh, depiction of anatomy and clothing um, and so on. But the new world, the new 20th century, we're in the 21st century now, of course, in the early part of the 21st century, but a dialogue uh, has happened uh, and the dialogue is going on inside of us and it has been going on since the bicameral mind from ancient times, uh, the voices that are heard uh, inside of us. In my own work, uh, the event series and types of work, I'm trying to explore uh, things that the eye does not see and to resurrect a new reality, a new way of looking um, by line, by texture, by sign, symbol, and signal, uh, technique of mark and scrape and uh, calligraphy to suggest the inner dialogue that's going on uh, back and forth between our hearts, our minds, and our soul. The tissue part is the brain, of course, and it's merely tissue, uh, not unlike um, a computer. And in that brain um, are all the connections and interconnections, but more important is the mind, which isn't a tissue, it is our comprehension, experience, uh, understanding, uh, put together uh, with our personality uh, to create our person, our being, our consciousness, and what we are, what we, we're becoming. So the past, yes, is important uh, to this history of what we are in art, uh, to abstraction uh, today, and as well uh, through uh, the scientific community, physics of uh, Heisenberg and Niels Bohr, uh, indeterminacy and uh, the wave-like, particle-like uh, character of the way that the quantum world, so to speak, the subatomic world, uh, is arranged. Uh, and so the uncertainty of that, is it or is it not? And I guess it kind of echoes the, the uh, angst uh, of the 20th century, is it or is it not? Um, and so Einstein, of course, contributed to a relativity theory of the speed of light and change through the speed of light. And more recently, of course, the understanding that there are subliminal subluminal speeds faster than the speed of light uh, that indicate that the world that we think we see is not really what it is. And so uh, the representation of this world looks and has an appearance of form and solidity. And so thereby it doesn't frighten us. We think that um, this is the way uh, things are. Our semblance uh, of our being, of course, is driven around our gravity. And we touch the earth and it pulls us down and our world is all under the realm of the influence of gravity. And so our world is put together by gravitational forces. Um, and we see the effect of these gravitational forces, us sticking on the earth and objects falling and apples falling and the universe and the moon falling, the universe is continuing uh, to move, and to us it's imperceptible, um, uh, uh, that movement. But we're trying to dig a little deeper and to find 
reality that is deeper than what we can really merely see and what we can hear and what we can sense. The 14th century, of course, had a monk. Uh, his name was Master Erkhart, and he reiterated uh, the sermons of Mark, Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John uh, from the 14th century, 700 years ago. And he passed when he was 67. But he survived, and many of the people in the monastery survived because they cleaned their hands before they ate, and they cleaned and washed their body parts, and people outside the monastery were dying of the plague and dirt and, and various uh, diseases carried through unclean, unkempt um, behavior. But he's, his word has come today uh, in the original uh, form, uh, most of which uh, no computers and no recorders, so his sermons were based on Mark uh, Matthew, Luke, and John, but although uh, those sermons were really courted by memory, probably by nuns or Christian followers that were there, they had this huge memory uh, they were able to use, and they recorded everything by memory. And so the diction and grammar, uh, the, the sense of, of the sermon was written down after uh, these were, his sermons were uh, talked about and given. So he was really significant and carried in early translations to the modern times of a behavior of the Old Testament and New Testament and the behavior of Judaic values and Christian values have really formed uh, via St. Jerome uh, in the fourth, uh, fourth century, and uh, St. Augustine in the fourth century, have really formed uh, some uh, judicial uh, values, values of moral conduct and behavior, um, and civilization uh, as we know it uh, today, a rule of law, which is uh, really important. And it was carried through the modern times uh, in the sermon. And we give thanks uh, to what he's done and brought 700-year-old uh, history into the modern uh, time. My influence is, of course, uh, as stated, uh, of course, but Altamira and Lascaux, uh, the scratches and the homage to animals in the human hand, and, uh, of course, not rendered atomically, anatomically correct of marks and calligraphy and scratches in this hidden cave and protected from light and pillaging and damage being, by their nature of them uh, being hidden uh, from that time to now and rediscovered. And so the uh, time then... Um, has brought us into the really the modern times uh, now, which gives us a really solid base to base our humanity on. And decisions then should be based on our humanity. Of course, there's no humanity present in Aleppo, Syria, where several hundred thousand uh, have died by many sides. We don't know which side is firing upon on you. There's at least four sides of that action. A hundred thousand uh, people uh, have died through the corruption of human nature. Of course, Nepal recently, the earthquakes by uh, forces of nature, only a very small amount of people. I mean, 5,000 or more have died, but in comparison to the corruption through time of human nature, not following some kind of real values that are human values, that are humanity's values. We need a transformation of these values. My painting is about these values are, which are beneath the surface of the skin. Um, people say uh, to me, my paintings are green. And I use green because uh, I don't have many sometimes other colors. 
not to use, so I'll use green. Of course, green is a color you know, that has the most recognition in human sight and the eye's ability. It sees more values in green than it does in other uh, colors. Green, of course, is also healing, and it has some reference perhaps to biology and perhaps to Muskoka and events that are happening uh, there. And in hospitals, of course, green is predominant color of healing, treatment. Um, and so I have always uh, the struggle to maintain my independence of thought and feeling, emotion, and what my vision is. I mean, the uh, Greek uh, way, Oso Cosmo, that uh, is prevalent today, the thoughts of um, the dress, behavior, conduct, of course, uh, of the intellect and things and intelligentia of the intellect were looked upon as, from the Greeks, as the best of human nature, but the service industry and mechanics and gardeners and biologists and archaeologists and artists, potteries and poetry all use their hands, of course, uh, in trying to create new form that perhaps also Cosmo, keeping up with the Joneses, uh, is not uh, the cry um, for today. My cry for today, my uh, salvo over the bow, as we might say, is to be more and to allow our human spirit, our human nature, to become one. The oneness then is inclusive. It includes all, all faith, all color, all language, all countries. The oneness, some people uh, say it's God. But the oneness then uh, in God is a metaphor for trying to understand the inexplicable. And science, of course, there's no evidence uh, of mystical behavior. Science can't find any data in mystical behavior so they can experiment on it. And that's a good thing. But science has finally come up to realize that there are hidden variables in life. Hidden variables that they cannot see, the events that they cannot see, and the wholeness that they cannot see, and, and the immeasurable uh, that they cannot see. We need, I guess, uh, or maybe this, is that people are crying for perspective. Perspective. Perspective on their stock. And perspective on life. And really... Perspective comes from Euclid, uh, which is the right angles and two-dimensional uh, world uh, that exists. And people are still trying to live in the past, the two-dimensional world, the world of Euclid. You know, right angles and squares and cubes uh, and so on. Uh, but world is now elastic, and it's an elastic curve. It can change its shape, not unlike an amoeba, not unlike Salvador Dali's uh, clock flowing over the edge of a table. So art is imperative, and those of us who do it and are doing uh, what is known as abstraction uh, definitely uh, pay homage to the abstract painters throughout the world, the American abstract expressionists, the Canadian abstract painters, uh, especially in some way uh, Mark Rothko, who doesn't have a form in his paintings. They're formless. But what is this man talking about? Yes, that which is in life, which doesn't have a form and has a historicity, which is time past, time present, and time future. Then if those paintings deny access, they deny access for a reason, that that reason is that in life, there is no form. It is formless. It is timeless. It is in every time and in every place. So there is no time. There is eternity. The register of night and day shows us there's some travel. And the mechanical clocks show us the daytime 
upon which we have, um, that we live in. Um, so these things uh, are an, an imperative uh, that give us uh, a way forward. And through my, I'm trying to find a way through this and a way forward in a way forward that marries consciousness and abstraction. I thank you again. I'm going to continue this. Um, it is a little um, short in duration, but I'm going to continue again uh, in another day, in another talk, in another format, and trying to always, I'm always trying to reach, to reach so that it that it is encompassing and it is inclusive. Bye for now.